Okay, can we do one more round of applause? It's the end of this. I need your energy. Come on, let her rip. Yeah, okay. Cool. So the last couple of days have been a lot about uh, web dev, what you should be doing in the browser, how you should do it, frameworks and, and best practices. And I'm here to tell you I'm not talking about any of that. You can clap if you want. We're going to have a little fun in this session, and I'm going to kind of walk through what I've been doing the last couple of years um, and talking about play and how important play really is and how I think that if there's anything you take from this session, that you go back and you start to rethink your approach to how you do your work a little bit. And so I'm going to start off with a story. And um, I was in New York for five years. I just left, and um, I, work, I work for Microsoft. We have a big building in Times Square. It has a beautiful balcony. And I was out on the balcony with my friend Jesus. And I went to the edge of the balcony. And you have to understand, Jesus is your typical engineer, right? Like, just like time and detail oriented. You know, he knew how to have a good time. But, you know, just your typical kind of like, I come to work and I love my job, but I'm doing my job. And so we're on the balcony of our, our building, and I lean over and I start yelling, and I'm like, hey, John, John, right? And this is what it looks like. And he's like, who's John? Which one's John? Show me who's John. And I was like, I don't know, but there's like a thousand people down there. One of them needs to be John. <laughs> and he looked at me, and he just went like, wow, I need more of this. And I go, you need more stupidity? Like, and he's like, no, like, I just need a little more of this in my day to day. Like I'm at work, I'm laughing, that's funny, it's great. Um, how do I bring this into what I'm doing as, as a developer? And so, you know, I worked in New York for, for five years and I love to work, I live to work. Um, I'm embarrassed to say that, but it's true. And you know, there, there came a point where my job was great. I love my job, I have nothing to complain about with my job. Um, things were going good, right? Like I was, I was doing interesting stuff. Um, but I was starting to feel a little, you know, just like not motivated, <laughs> right? And, you know, those really simple things became really hard. Things were right in front of me. I couldn't finish tasks. Um, I was really irritated, and those random emails would piss me off, right? And I really started to have this weird kind of like agitation all the time, right? And, you know, I, I just didn't really, like, start to behave in a way that I should, right? <laughs> and I started to, you know, take every opportunity I could. I burnt myself out, right? And I burnt myself out because I stopped saying no, and I started saying yes to everything. And so I became that asshole you don't want to hire almost, right? And... I stopped for a moment and I realized that, you know, I didn't need to explain everything to everyone. <laughs> that sometimes people need to learn things for themselves. And so what I realized most was, have we forgot to play? I had forgotten to play. And I was getting up to do my job, to take away from my job what I could, but I had forgotten just having joy in what I was doing, even though I, I, I believed I loved it. And the other thing is being irritated and being unmotivated, even though I had no reason to be, those are the same signs as depression, right? If anyone's been depressed, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I've been depressed, severely depressed. And I realized, like, oh, no, am I depressed? And I was like, I have nothing to be depressed about, you know? And I realized that, like, we take depression more seriously than we did before, but yet we don't take burnout at work seriously at all. Actually, a company kind of expects it to happen, and then they try to fix it after the fact. And for me, this was just bullshit, right? And so I knew that I couldn't rely on people to fix it for me, that I had to fix it for myself. And so when I thought about it, I thought, like, have we forgot to play? Like, have we? And we have. And so when you think about a box, you give a kid a box, they're going to build you a spaceship. They're going to bring you to another world. But if you give an adult a box, they're moving. It's full of responsibilities, right? Like, if I gave you a box, you wouldn't create me a world out of it. You would say, well, what am I putting in here, right? That's fucked up. 
Like, you know, you think about a kid, you give them a cape, and suddenly there's a story and a narrative behind what they're doing, and then you give an adult a cape and it's only Halloween, right? Or Star Wars, okay? And so I started to think about these things, and I started to make play a priority for myself because no one else will, right? You have to understand, I live corp life, right? A hundred emails in my inbox all the time, um, you know, stuff I have to say yes to that I might not want to, you know, a system that kind of moves a little slower, right? And I willingly entered into it, and I actually really love it. But what I realized is that no one understood what I needed from my job, and they weren't going to give it to me. So I found a way to make it happen, right? And so I realized that playing is a muscle, and it needs to be exercised. You don't wake up and you're not suddenly innovative. You don't wake up and you're not suddenly creative, right? It just, it's not something that happens, okay? It's a muscle, and for me, I need to practice that, practice that muscle. And being in corp life, I started to do things like this. Should I reply all? You know, and I put this out there. I got an email, someone replied all. It literally took down our servers. And then I thought, maybe people need a diagram. So I did this, and the next thing you know, I was at a conference in Halifax, and they asked me to be on the news to explain this diagram. And I thought that was pretty funny. And then I started doing these little 15-minute exercises. And one of them that I did was um, I wrote a program, because I am a developer, I wrote a program that would go to Facebook, randomly pick a friend, choose one of their oldest photos, and post something on it at 3.30 in the morning. <laughs> so you can see the result. Right, 2007, I post something in 2014, <laughs> and then you see my friend like, that's creepy. <laughs> Check. Right, 15 minutes it took me to write this before I started what I needed to do. Right, but this brings me so much joy. <laughs> right, and you can do that. And so I started to do it also on Instagram. We have a, we have a service, Cognitive uh, Services, you can send it an image, it'll tell you what's in it. So I started doing this on Instagram with my friends. Anytime they posted something like, you know, I'm on the beach, I'm having a drink, you know, like stuff that you want to do but you can't because you have life. I just like would post like, that's okay, I guess, <laughs> right? And so, you know, you started to see these kind of things, um, you know, show up, uh, me posting on them, sometimes me getting a reaction out of them too, right? And that's really where I was starting to feed. And I started to do these things, these little things that didn't relate necessarily to my job, but I knew that I could bring back to my job somehow. And so I started collaborating with people, and, you know, I have an idea. I would find someone who could help me do it. We created these T-shirts, for example. I got pissed off about, you know, uh, the gender divide in tech, and I was like, nah, I'm just going to wear a shirt that says I can do it better than you, whatever, right? And, and collaborated with someone to do this and then give the proceeds to an organization. And so, you know, during these times, I just started doing these random experiments that I'll, I'll show you. Some of them were a little pre-Microsoft, um, but it'll kind of give you a sense of, you might be day-to-day -day doing X, but playing with Y can add so much value that you can bring back to your X, right? And poor X and Y, they're like, please stop talking about me. So, when I was in Brooklyn, I met uh, Dane Sh Dave Scheinkoff, who's kind of like a, a weird art hardware um, kind of mastermind genius, and, and he was teaching an Arduino class. And I didn't take it because it was Arduino, I took it because he was teaching electronics. I don't care about the Arduino at this point, I know how to use it. I want to know low-level electronics, I want to get out of my comfort zone. And so I, I made him my friend, I do that sometimes, you're going to be my friend. Um, a lot of people don't react well to that, so don't try it. And we set up a little place that we could work, this is when I worked at Big Spaceship. Um, I said, hey, I want to do some creative experiments. Can I have a space? They said, sure, here's a closet. So we set up a space, and the first thing we started working on was this thing called Booty Bump. And I wasn't very familiar with the Raspberry Pi. I wanted to try it out. This was years ago. But I didn't really care about the Raspberry Pi. I cared about the electronics. So I wanted to create um, you know, this moment in time, and I wanted to figure out an installation for it. And the moment in time, and as developers, even designers, you'll, you'll understand. You know when you sit down and you write like 50 lines of code and it just magically works? Has anyone had that? Right? And then you kind of do this. And you look over your shoulder. And then you're like, you're like nah, 
there's no way. And then you run it and it works, and then you're like, nah. And then you're like, oh my God, I'm a golden god, it works. Right? I'm making things levitate. And, and, and then you go to tell the designer or producer or project manager or your cat beside you, and they don't give a shit, like, because that's your job, right? And so I wanted to create that moment in time that you could celebrate any of those kind of feelings, and no one had to care what it was about. It's just that you had your own personal success. And so that's how Booty Bump came about. It's the idea that you would go, and we put two sensors in, and basically, you would have to go in and booty bump it. Both cheeks have to match, not just one. Don't cheat. And once you do that, you get eight seconds of major laser and like lights going off and on, right? So then we molded it after my body. I saw this thing on Cupcake Wars. Again, you can judge me later. And they would do sculptures with uh, chicken wire. And so I did the same thing with my body. Um, yeah, it's not really, it didn't turn out, but I tried. And we put this up in the office, and this lasted for about, you know, no longer than four hours before they're like, okay, you've got to turn that crap off. <laughs> but I saw the most interesting things. I saw the person who does uh, our financial our accounting in the office go up and use it. I saw our receptionist go up and use it. I saw the designers and the developers go up and use it. And just the joy in their face. You don't get that from the browser. And so for me, I was like, oh, I'm hooked. I'm going to make useless shit from now on, <laughs> right? And so, you know, we prototyped it. And again, everything I'm about to show you is not, like, technically amazing or savvy or installation. And that's kind of the point. I want to encourage you to just get down and dirty and just make stuff. And so this is Dave. We did it. And that's our prototype with Homer holding two donuts, right? You can hear my laughing. <laughs> And then we put it into a different format. Ridiculous. Right? And all of a sudden, I just started to think about things in a different way. And so we had another one that we did. Um, and I worked with Dave quite a bit, because he didn't know software, and he, I didn't know hardware. And it was a great way for me to just kind of express myself in a different way and learn. And so we created something called um, Grid A, Kid A. Um, and basically, does anyone remember the days of SkyMall? Right, Sky Mall. So Sky Mall was my, was my goal before it shut down. If I could get something in Sky Mall, I thought I had made it. Sky Mall is is a place where it basically shows you problems you didn't know you had because of the solutions it offers, right? <laughs> and so when I looked at Sky Mall, um, I really was like, oh, you know, Sky Mall has everything. It has like zombies and it has like, you know, hot dog toasters and <laughs> social skill builders and. <laughs> you know, business etiquette. And so I started to think a lot about, like, you know, people saw me as this person who worked all the time. Immediately, if you work all the time and you're single, you're a cat lady. I didn't have any cats, but whatever, I owned it. And I started to think about that moment about having cats at Sky Mall. There's got to be an opportunity there. And I thought about the moment you have a cat and you leave the house you didn't give it the right food, and it's suddenly posting pics of itself, you know, on Facebook. Um, you know, it's like an animal drinking out of a toilet bowl, you know, or eating out of your fruit bowl right after. Um, you walk in, and it's just like, get out. You don't even know what's going on in here. You fall down, and they're basically just watching for you to get up and laughing at you, you know. And, you know, that one day where you might die, you might be all alone, which is my greatest fear, I'm not going to lie. And you, <laughs> you know, a cat's not sitting on there for warmth. It's checking your breath, because the moment you're dead, it's going to eat your face, right? <laughs> so I'm thinking about these things. I'm thinking about Sky Mall, and we started to troll the internet for anything that was cat-related, and we found these little figurines. And we thought this figurine was a lot bigger, and it ends up being about, <laughs> about the size of a mouse. So we were like, oh, what if we replaced the mouse with a cat? And so what we did is we put conductive wire and we ran a little trinket through it and put little uh, LEDs in its eyes, right? And kind of configured it as a mouse. And what we did is we wrote a note app and it would go to Instagram and it would search for Kite, the tag. Don't search for that. You get some questionable results. <laughs> um, things I did not expect. And we, you know, we started to create something that was... Uh, a kind of like controller, right? And so, you know, you're scrolling through pictures. 
And then what you don't see is you can pat and the eyes kind of go crazy and you're actually downloading that photo because you're a cat person, you probably want to save it, right? We built out something called uh, Haptic Hoot. It was a quick little game made in Unity. Um, and again, all these things, we just, I was like, you know, work was like, hey, Unity's getting popular, maybe you could pick up some Unity, and I was like, cool. And then, of course, I don't do things the way I'm kind of told to. So, oh, okay, I want to build a, you know, a DDR controller. And so, you know, here's our, our bad, bad prototype. They're actually pretty quick. They're not bad, pretty responsive. Oh, yeah. And so, you see this kind of controller that we built out, and then we kind of put it in this casing, and I created a game that can control and works like, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> we told you to learn Unity, you know? I was, yeah, but I made it fun, you know, like for someone else. And so the whole time I'm building out these things on my own time, but also on work's time, and I'm trying to figure out how do I change what they think we should be doing, right? How do I make work what I want it to be? And that's one of the biggest challenges. And so where I had success was we had an offsite and everyone gets together and they show the stuff they've been working on. And so, you know, everyone's like, hey, I built an app that does this. You know, hey, I took this open data and blah, blah, blah. And then I come up and I'm like, so one night on Amazon, I might have had a little too much to drink and I'd like to do some shopping. And I ordered something I didn't and I modded it. And so I presented something to them that changed how they thought uh, we as public-facing evangelists should maybe be approaching some of our work, not all of our work. So I was getting somewhere. And so I was with my nephew. This is my nephew, um, cutest kid in the world. Uh, he is perfect. Don't tell me otherwise. Um, and he was like into dubstep. He was like, oh, Stacy, you know that song? And I'd be like, yeah, I love that song. It's better if it's dubstep. So he taught me about Skrillex. And, he, you know, I still think Skrillex looks a little like... Uh, good old buddy from the 80s. Um, and he, I started to think about Skrillex, and he was talking about dubstep, and <laughs> I was like, I must be able to do something with this. So thought about Skrillex. Skrillex kind of looks like that. <laughs> I'm on Amazon, um, and I am, you know, uh, probably about 2 in the morning Friday, uh, screwing up every, uh, you know, kind of recommended search algorithm out there. <laughs> and I buy this. I don't know why, but I was like, <laughs> tiny, tiny arms, awesome bot. And I modded it to add some hair, I added some glasses, and I added a little sensor, right? And I wrote a processing script, and... processing script across to the MIDI protocol and I started with some of the software that people were using Ableton to create dubstep and I was automatically on the fly having this dinosaur drop some bass, <laughs> right? And work was just like, this has no practical use, <laughs> right? And when I demoed it, I'll be very honest, my demo didn't work. And they still loved it. And all of a sudden, they, people started to change. And one of the terms I was really proud to say in my old job, one of the terms they would say is, how much Stacy does that have in it? Meaning, how much whimsy or how much whatever. And I was like, holy shit, like I'm making an impact with my own team. You know? And so, of course, they're like, that's awesome, but you should probably build something practical. So I went back, and I built something called Tweetheart that got picked up uh, by... Um, you know, Hackaday and, uh, and Adafruit, and I literally, it's just NeoPixels, um, and it's basically an analog light that does certain animations based on the tweeming st uh, Twitter streaming API, right? And so nothing too crazy, but it serves a purpose because it uses the APIs, it uses the platform, and looks really beautiful in the dark, and I put this out there, and then the next thing I know, I had 
had two or three people contact me going, going could you make me something but kind of like this? Like for this team I love or for this. And so suddenly I had about three or four projects after this that I did in my own time that I built for someone else and I charged them for it. And all of a sudden you put it out there and people are coming to you. So number one lesson there is if you are going to make something and you want to be doing something, put it out there. It's not magically going to come to you, right? And so after this, you know, I, I was starting to get some headway, I feel like, at Corp Life a little bit. And I started to still feel a little bit like I didn't know what I was doing. And I wasn't totally inspired. And so I started to give back. And so this is a point where people talk about emotions. And I, I kind of break up every time I talk about this because I feel like it's a fundamental, pivotal moment in my career. And if you haven't give back, I'll tell you the story, and I hope that you do. And so, um, also, if you think I'm crying, that's a fucking illusion, all right? <laughs> so, I was at a conference in Halifax, and it was called the Clyde Conference. They had invited me a couple times, and I was at this event the night before, and it was a women's event. I typically, uh, I'm going to be honest, they make me uncomfortable. So, I was there, and I was teaching uh, women how to use the Arduino, and Amanda came up. This is Amanda. At the time, she was 15 from Halifax, and... She is a child of the gaming industry. Her parents met online playing games. She knows everything there is to know about games. She talks so eloquently and knowledge knowledgeably about games and game design and all that kind of stuff. And I said to her, well, have you ever made a game? And she said, no. And I said, listen, I'm here for three days. I talk. I'm, per I'm ready. I've got time. I will make time for you. You come find me. It's up to you. And so over the course of three days, we kind of made like a Flappy Bird clone I taught her graphics, I taught her Unity, I taught her C-sharp. She didn't know any of this stuff. And we sat there and we did it, and people in the conference started to watch us, and people were interested in how the progress was going along. And at the end of it, she was offered an internship that summer to work at one of the local companies, right? So Amanda changed my life because... Fuck. <laughs> Because up to this point, I had spoken at so many conferences, and I did not give a single time of day for anyone. I didn't help them solve a problem. I didn't bounce off ideas. I just came in. I did my thing. I was social. And she made me realize how important giving back was. And so when I'm at these things, I always try to, as much as I can, make myself available to help prepare a program or give you ideas or talk about whatever. And so... I started something called Young Game Makers, where I started to teach kids in my own time how to make games. And so in this picture, you'll see Chase. Chase is going to be your boss. He is, like, born to be a CEO. Um, and you'll, I started to teach kids uh, Scratch and Unity and JavaScript. Um, and I taught probably over 1,000 kids over the course of that year. I donated crazy amounts of my own time. Um, and we also charged for some of these tickets, and we donated that all back to orgs that would actually do a better job of teaching than I. And I felt like I was doing something for the community. I felt like I was opening doors instead of us automatically closing them. And you all in this room have the ability to open doors for people. You have the ability to go in to a young woman or a young man and explore you know, possibilities that they didn't consider, right? And so, you know, you look at it, they come in and they create their artwork and they do all this stuff, and then suddenly I was getting emails like this. And, you know, blah, 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 thank you so much, it's great. Um, thanks again, you're a great person. Whoa, you're a great person. Whoa. <laughs> you're a great person. Okay, this dude has not seen me on a Friday night, three bourbons in, telling war stories, right? So... I started to feel like I was actually doing something valuable. And, uh, you know, ran a conference in New York, JS Day, and I made everyone, for example, come in and give food donations so that they felt like they were, you know, contributing to something and giving back. And I started on that path, and I gave a lot of my time for a year. The one thing I realized is that if you become a yes person and you volunteer for these things, then you easily also get burnt out from that. Because people will ask you all the time, and so that's why I implore all of you to give a little bit of your time so that it's not relying on the shoulders of a few, you know? And then I look at this year. This year is full of changes for me. 
And this year was kind of like this, where I was like looking around, doing my thing, you know, having a good time. And then, oh, shit. <laughs> and so this year, um, this year, this was my first client, if that makes sense. I had a I took on a new job at Microsoft. I was an evangelist at a New York. I loved my job. I had no reason to leave it. Um, I didn't, they did realize at some moment in New York that I was going to have a sex in the city moment. Like, I'm 40, I'm in New York, I'm single. I don't want to go there. It's time to get out. And so I had this job opportunity um, in Vancouver, and they had uh, something we call the garage. And the garage at Microsoft is an internal and external resource um, that kind of focuses on providing opportunities and programming for Microsoft in, uh, employees um, that they wouldn't get in their day-to-day, -day, uh, grow their technical skills or their creativity skills, right? Like, okay, blah, 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 marketing, vague, 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 right? That's all you probably heard. Um, I know, I can do that too. Um, <laughs> I want to God joke my eyes, though. Um, so basically what my job is, is I have a big makerspace with all the tools I could possibly want and possibly have. I have a budget, and I am basically kind of in charge of culture change in a weird way. How do we get people working differently? How do we get them thinking differently? How do we get them making things that they can't do on their day-to-day -day basis? How do we get them to have these outlets, right? Um, and also doing some external with that. And so the first day or first week right before I'm about to start, they're like, we have a grand opening. Uh, you know, Justin Trudeau, the prime minister, the prime minister that everyone loves that, you know, babies love, that pandas love, that Obama loves, you know, that, I mean, the press loves. This is going to be here. He's going to be here, and you need to give him a gift. You need to make him something. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> so my first inkling was, I want to make him a, a rolling pin that's engraved with, like, Trudeau, but it's, like, true, and then it has, like, Simpson with dough, right? <laughs> and I was like, eh. So, you know, but the thing was is that work never told me what to make. They just told me to make something. So I made some skate decks for him and for the um, premier and for the, um, for the mayor, uh, and I worked on this deck with a friend of mine. He's an illustrator out of Ottawa who works for Fuel. He's really talented. And we got them done. And I got to gift on my first week and meet the prime minister. Not meet the prime minister, but gift him something. I saw him from afar. Uh, you know, I wouldn't be able to. I'd just be like, oh. Um, and so that was my first week. And so, you know, thinking about how do I get people at work to change how they're approaching things and to change how they're thinking about things and, you know, their problem-solving <laughs> skills. Right? Like, this is my job in a GIF right here. And so, you know, we look at kind of the space that I have and the people who are in it, and I realize that a lot of these developers are doing their thing, they're in this playground, they're very comfortable, and then you also have a little bit of this. <laughs> right? And my space is a space where you can fail, you can come in, and it's what you do with it. <laughs> right? And so I started making things. I started making my space look different than any other space in the building. When you come into my space, you should see all sorts of things that are Easter eggs or treats or delight, right? Because you shouldn't feel like you're in corporate life. You should feel like you walked into somewhere special. And so I started just putting stuff out there, right? All sorts of stuff. Little notes that I would drop on people's desks like, you're fucking perfect, or I love your work, right? I started making signs, having fun with it, <laughs> right? I made more signs, right? You know, so Bob Ross and Mr. T and, oh, Guy Fieri, who I hate to death, is in my space. And I started just like, you know, having, making little coins, for example, and giving them to people. Hey, come, let's have coffee. I want to talk about your ideas. And kind of engaging them in different ways, leaving little coasters for them and, and making sure that things just looked really different. And people have started to treat it that way, right? You know, and they start to see that my personality's all over that, right? All these things, whether it's just an Easter egg like this that they might or might not see, right? Or, yeah, come on, that's good. I mean, seriously. 
Like, you guys are like, your laughter went, meh. And it's like, no, come on. You know, and I started to see the things that they were making right off the bat. First thing, you know, uh, uh, Pokemon being printed on a 3D printer. I gave someone perler beads and they make a poop icon, right? One guy you learned um, had a 3D print. This is the first thing he printed. Does anyone know what this says? Yeah, send me nudes, right? Okay, so like I see this and I'm like, uh, uh can't endorse that. Um, but that's awesome because, you know, like he created something and he had like, he had motivation. Who am I? I'm going to turn a blind eye, right? Just don't put this up on your webcam at work and we're good, you know? But the same guy, he met another guy in my space. They don't work on the same team. They're actually what we call remote workers. So they work on our facility, but their team's in Redmond. And they started to have this idea about making the best foosball um, kind of competitor they could. Could they use deep learning and machine learning combined with hardware um, to create something that learns the more that you play? They had never 3D printed. They didn't know electronics. I saw them blow a capacitor, like, straight up, like, past my head almost. Oh, that's when I stepped in and helped them. Um, <laughs> you know, kind of let them explore it. But they did all this stuff, and then they were featured on the news for it, for a passion project that they're continuing, right? And I see this as, like, holy crap. Like, this is happening at Microsoft, right? Like, this is, ha like... Like Clippy over there, blue screen you know, over there, and this shit. Like it's <laughs> awesome. And so I feel like I'm seeing these signs of like things actually happening. And we had these interns, they came in, and these interns were probably the most socially awkward people I've seen in, a, in quite a while. <laughs> they were really lovely and, and really great, but they were just, you know, it's a big company, it's scary, and you could tell that, and you, know, you could see that. And so they, had, they worked on this um, kind of like this bot framework project, and they had it called HackBot. And they had to go present it at a science fair um, that we have internally. We have a one-week hackathon that we run. And so I said, why don't you create these big heads? Just, just go with it. Take your logo, be stupid, have fun with it. Let's make you these big heads with LED eyes. And they did that. And suddenly they put them on and they become different people. They're like, hey, you want to hear about my project? Check out what I built. And they're like, you know, engaging people, you take it off, they're like, no eye contact, <laughs> you know. But, you know, again, like just, just an, uh, an agent of change and finding those kind of things as they go along. And so, you know, I'm starting to see these things where I was doing this three years ago um, at a company that I didn't believe would embrace it right? And I just kept at it. I kept like being passionate um, about these little things, whether it's the presentations I give or whether it's the projects I build or, you know, always being smart, meeting the things that you need to do, but making sure you don't lose yourself. And I started to find joy again in, in what I was doing. And I think a lot of the joy comes from the fact that I was able to celebrate other people's success like it was my own, right? You know, and I don't think we do enough of that. And this year, for example, I stopped taking all the opportunities for myself and I started giving them to other people. Hey, Stacy, would you like to speak? I've got the perfect person for you. And I would start to give opportunities away and start to lift people up um, actively. And I started to feel better about what I was doing because, uh, you know, I don't need the big clients. I don't need the big projects. I just need to walk away from what I'm doing at work and feel like... I gave something, but also feel like it brings me some kind of humor, some kind of joy, right? And so I try to do that at work now. I try to celebrate people making things specifically for them, uh, talking to them about their interests, um, you know, whether it's making really just crappy awards. I'm not a designer, but whatever. Um, you know, one of the guys helped me a lot, and <laughs> I made him like a passive-aggressive award. Like, you're okay, I guess, you know. Um, and these things, people now are starting to, not only are they kind of open to receiving them, they're starting to do it themselves. Um, we had someone at work who came to me and said, I want to make something that I can just slide over to someone on their desk that's just basically, like, I love what you're doing. Like, I love your work. Now, a lot of you are going, oh, 
it's emotional. And like, I got a cold, cold heart, right? Uh, maybe not 20 minutes ago, but I got a cold, cold heart. And I get that. But I'm going to tell you, if you are at work and you feel, uh, and you feel the, the lack of morale from your team, doing these little unexpected things, these little nice, sweet, unexpected things, funny, whatever, it changes it. It might only change it for the day, but the day is all you need. Because people go day by day, right? And so doing these things, whether it's playing a little joke on someone's computer or you know, foiling their desk when they go away, bringing joy to your environment, don't expect the environment to be something you imagine it to be. You've got to actively make it that, right? Because the moment you sit back and you say, oh, th this is the way it is, then that's the moment you should be leaving your job. If at any moment you feel that way, I can't change this. Well, do you accept it? Because if you don't, get the hell out, right? And so we put on things like sumo bot battle, right? I'm doing a sumo bot battle for everyone. I'm teaching them how to use Node and JavaScript, and we're making little, um, uh, little bots that are going to battle each other. And instead of it making it like, oh, we're going to have a little battle, I have posters. I have little coins. I have everything that makes everyone so excited for this little thing because they're going to learn something new. And then I had probably the biggest moment, I would say, of my career personally, and you can judge whether or not, but I was at an event, and uh, about two weeks ago they told me, sorry, about a month ago they told me, hey, you know, um, so the board of Microsoft is going to visit Vancouver. Okay, cool. They're going to be in your space. Cool. It's going to be uh, the CEO, Satya, and it's going to be Bill Gates. Bill fucking Gates? Right? Like, holy shit. So, like, immediately, I'm like, oh, my God. Right? Um, I have a really soft spot for a person that gives a lot of their wealth away and is dedicating their life right now to the causes that they are. And I was just like, holy crap. So, I started uh, thinking about what can I make? What can I make? What can I make? I got to put something up in my space. And I opened up processing, and I started playing with processing a little bit, because um, I wanted to start with code. And then I ended up with something, and I brought it into Illustrator. And what I did is I basically did a geometric portrait of him from a photo, and I cut it out in acrylic. And there I am, 2 AM, the day before he comes, hot gluing the stuff. By the way, glue guns, like, holy, like, can you tell me something that I'd rather want to like stomp out worse than a glue gun? Like, you're burning your hands. Like, crafting is not enjoyable. <laughs> and so, you know, I recreate this, this thing, and I put it together, and it's 18 by 24, and it's huge. We put it up on the wall. I walk away. A piece falls off. I'm like, oh, my God, this, is, this can't happen. We put it together. And then I'm sitting there having a chat um, with some of my coworkers, and, uh, and some of you might have saw uh, Tommy Lee's talk this morning on bots. Tommy's beside me. So Tommy's a big fanboy, and Bill Gates ghosted in on a conversation with us. He's just like, what's up? <laughs> Not quite like that, but you know, like he ghosted in, and I just looked to the Bill Gates, and there's Tommy, <laughs> like stuck in time permanently. And I looked to him, and you have to understand, he like, you know, Executives, they don't know what they're doing every minute of the day. Someone takes care of them. They have handlers. They have security, etc. cetera. Um, and I say to him, you know, hey, like, uh, I made something in your likeness. I don't know if you're going to like it. If you don't like it, don't fire me. We can just take it off the wall. <laughs> so you can imagine what he's thinking. Like, I joined this conversation. I don't know who the hell you are. And our PR person comes in and is like, oh, this is Stacy. She runs this space right here. You're going to be doing a tour at two. Uh, she made something specifically, like, you know, basically translating what I kind of blurb. And, like, I literally always, like, did one of these out of the conversations, you know, and then looked at Tommy, and Tommy's still, like, <laughs> paralyzed, right? And, uh, and so the next day, he came into my space, um, and he checked out his portrait, and that night, they also took the photo with it. So for me, this is amazing pinnacle for me of my career, and I'll tell you the reason why, is that I'm a developer, and everyone in my office thinks I'm an artist. And I find that just amazing. I find that awesome because I suddenly am taking that idea that something could start with code, something could start one way, end up another way, and people are open to it. And so 
I love it. They think I'm the creative one. I mean, I worked at ad agencies for 10 years, not allowed to even sit at the table because I was a dev, right? And suddenly they think I'm the creative one, and so I'm like, <laughs> got them fooled. But, you know, I'm having these moments, and so as we continue to work, you know, I, it's, I'm in a weirdly optimistic place because three years ago I would have told you there's no way I could have changed or affected change the way I have. And I've done this several times at jobs, and I realize, in the moment you realize, that no one's going to give you what you don't ask for, that, you know, you can make that environment what you want to be. It just means that you've got to think outside of what you're doing if it's not working, right? Um, that you have those opportunities to change that for yourself. You really do. And I'm living proof of that. And, you know, living in the environment and the parameters that I do every day, I wake up and I embrace my inner five-year-old, which is this girl. <laughs> um, not literally me. I wish it was me. Um, and every day I say, like, I'm going to beat to my own drum. I'm going to do what I think is right. And I'm going to start pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing, right? And so... I guess that's kind of my message to you when it comes to play, is that play doesn't have to be completely useful. It doesn't have to have an endpoint. It doesn't have to have a purpose. It will find its application, right? Um, it will bring you more joy. And figuring out how to add that to your environment on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, you, you can do it. And this isn't coming from a place of privilege, like do what you love, everything will fall out of the sky. It's very much... Be active, be very, very, very uh, consistent and progressive about it, and you can start to change some of those things as well. I'm going to leave you with a burrito. <laughs>